there is no skull without bulk. There is no yin without yang. And yet, you could even say there is no Power Rangers secret identity without a bulk skull. When I mention Paul Schreier, I mentioned Jason Narvey, because those two always worked together, Bulk and Skull on the show. They were like the comic relief. And those guys connected. They were Laurel Hardy. You know, they were uh, this amazing comic team and always so funny, always so committed. They added so much to Power Rangers, the show and the film. Always the, uh, the comedic outlet uh, maybe that the show needed when we were too busy getting too serious with our fights. They were just incredibly talented actors, and I have a lot of respect for them. Uh, I mean, they didn't get to do all the things that they can do on the show, but um, they really are amazing. The thing is, is we were on the set and we were all kind of new to acting. Paul and Jason were trained actors. Like, they were doing Hamlet in between takes, where we were like, you know, chewing bubble gum. Hi, Skull. Hi, Bulk. Hey, let's take a look at those two. What do you think, huh? <laughs> nice! Yeah. Very, very nice. Hey, hey, listen. <laughs> What do you think they're talking about? Yeah. My classic good looks. Paul was there from the very beginning. And Jason Narvey came later, after the pilot. I was one of the first people called that day for the role I was called for, I think Punk 5 or whatever. And, and I showed up a little bit early, and immediately, as soon as I was in the door, the writer, Tony Oliver, was like, oh, thank heavens, I don't have to pretend like I'm fighting anymore. So I, he was like, yeah, I, I'm acting as you. So, hey, you, you're, you're this guy, okay, you stand here. And then I just took over rehearsing with the actors, which they were scheduled for rehearsal pre, uh, precedent to the auditions for the punks. So, and then when the audition happened, like it was, I had already known them all for 40 minutes. And so I, I had to jump on the other cats and, and plus I can take a hit, you know, convincingly and fall down, which came in handy later. <laughs> Unfortunately for that one, I walked in and there was probably 20 or 30 people that looked like David Yost because I was auditioning for Billy and I didn't even know that because I guess I looked like a nerd, which is funny because David Yost doesn't. I mean, he's like one of the best looking like chiseled guys, dimple chin, doesn't look like a nerd at all. So if they put my resume and photo on file, they cast the pilot, they did the pilot, they sold it to Fox. And then like six months later, they decided they had to get rid of Skull. In the original pilot, uh, Bulk and Skull were not the same characters. Skull was the leader. And he was the one that, like, really got up on, on Kimberly and, like, made her feel really uncomfortable. And Bulk, really, punk number two, only had the line, Hey, man! And got up and tried to attack them. And so when they actually went to do the show, they decided we should do some comedy with these guys. Paulie was the better actor. And he had comic timing. So they actually cast him as the leader and Skull as the sidekick. And so they just said... We need a new skull. <laughs> we need somebody that's not quite as menacing. So they went through the uh, reject pile. That's where I was living, in the reject pile. They pulled five, six, seven, ten guys. They said, okay, here, pull these guys in and see who, see which one of these rejects is our reject. And that's how I ended up getting the audition. Pure dumb luck. Oh, no, look who's here. Bulk and skull. Hi, girls. How about that double date we talked about? Yeah. <laughs> In the very early going, they were just kind of teenage bullies. They were punks. They were the kinds of kids you did not want around. In theory, in theory, they were the people that made life at Angel Grove High School miserable. You are dust. Yeah. You are dust. Temper, temper. <laughs> At some point, though, we realized that the underdog is kind of the person that many kids really are. And Bulk and Skull being bad guys, punks and bullies as underdogs, you didn't want to see the Power Rangers beating up on them because suddenly the Power Rangers looked like they were about to become bullies. So Bulk and Skull became the kind of lovable outsiders, just sort of Laurel and Hardy of the Power Rangers world. Some might argue that the characters are kind of superfluous and that they appear kind of like randomly, and at their worst, I think that's true in terms of using them, you know, in, in the script. But at, at its best, it was a perfectly timed bumper for the action or just a moment of levity 
that really kind of helped the really kitschy action stuff. In the very, very early footage, the comedy would be in like the Power Rangers themselves. They'd try to morph and then it didn't work. They'd all fall on each other. Or Billy would do something awkward or something weird would happen with Alpha. And in the Japanese show, there's no comic relief. Occasionally, the Rangers themselves are funny, but, but they didn't have any comic characters. And we felt that, especially at that time, uh, on children's television, it was important that we that we showed a little bit of balance and that we not have the Power Rangers be funny. I mean, they have their moments, but let's bring in a couple of comic characters. It's my opinion that the producers started the show with a very firm idea of what they wanted our characters to be. Your classic big guy, little guy, comic duo, not super deep, but fulfilling the role of, you know, foils for our heroes. Haim is very enamored with slapstick. So he wanted, you know, on every episode, something to get dumped all over Vulk. <laughs> that uh, they always get their comeuppance, but in a funny way. We worked really hard to kind of take it back to this older aesthetic, the old slapstick comedy stuff. Three Stooges, Laurel and Hardy, Charlie Chaplin, Fatty Arbuckle, Buster Keaton. And we really kind of put that into the vernacular so kids could relate to the slapstick and have something to laugh at. Oh, you should have seen what we had to go through battling that huge lantern monster. Yeah, and those huge pigeons. Skull reached for his detective manual and we cornered him <laughs> one by one. No matter how thin the script was, we understood it was they were reliant on the performers to bring it through, to invent. Um, and fortunately, we got the full support of all the writers and all the staff. The lines weren't even on the paper. I mean, they were so good that the director ended up keeping their ad libs. I don't really remember directing them except to say, why don't you come in from over there and do your thing and show us. We'll figure out how to shoot it. Certain directors were great with it. And it got to the point where most of the directors really wanted to work with Bulk and Skull because they had their own innovations. So when you got the writing team and the directing team and Paulie and I all on the same page, there was a sort of a golden age of Bulk and Skull. Uh, Terry Winkless is one of those people. Bob Hughes is another one of those people, big fans. Um, Doug. Sloan, huge proponent of Vulcan Skull, and wrote for him. Doug and Anne wrote very well for Vulcan Skull. The thing about Bulk is he was physically talented, just so physically talented. There was one episode where we had a dance off and we're kind of pulling it out of the hat. You know, it's not like we had a, a long time to figure out what we're gonna do. It's, we get on the set that morning and we read it in the script the night before, okay? And I'm like, okay, well, I'm gonna do this. So I'll throw something out and he does something back. And I'm, then I'm gonna do this. And I'll throw something out and he does something back. And I'll throw something else out and he does that too. And 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 each time it became physically more challenging. Like, you know, it's like I did six spins and stop with a flare. And so he'd throw it in two, he'd get in two. And he's not a dancer, you know. Like, he would get in two and then go down to a half split. And you're like, wow, that is crazy. All of us are born with inherent physical talents. And mine is that I'm very flexible for a big guy. And then, you know, I would go and do like a handstand on top of a counter, you know, and like I'd jump up on the counter and do a handstand, and he would have to go and try to do the same thing, which is pretty much impossible for him to do, but he would sell it and then flip all the way over the counter onto a mat, you know, in the back, and, you know, it come up with food and slop all over them and just, man, what physically gifted guy that guy is. You start training and they, somebody teaches you how to fall and you're like, that doesn't hurt. I always thought that that would hurt, but it doesn't hurt. So let's fall, I wanna fall down again. In fact, I wanna fly through the wall. And really every moment they would come to me like, do you think you could throw yourself off the building? I'm like, what, you got a bag? Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> They've definitely gone through an evolution of presentation. Like initially, they were punks, right? The, your classic bullies. And then we kind of transmogrified into um, buffoonish antagonists, I guess, kind of like half and halfers. I'm the incredible bookster! And I'm a super sky! So the second season, they're like, okay, well, we need to integrate them more into the season. So they did this thing, Bulk and Skull need to find out who the Power Rangers were. And this was a real defining moment for Bulk and Skull, where we start having our own storyline. We have nothing to do with the Power Ranger line, really, 
at all. It was a natural transition to take us away from that monochromatic kind of theme and, and to um, to be reinvented in some way every year with the series. What transpired from there was Bulk and Skull going into the police academy, where actually their self-servingness became, I think, the one of the better manifestations of the guys that get dumped on that you can empathize with. That's why we put in Greg Bullock. You're going to be washing the mayor's car for five years. Then you're going to be washing my car I for five years. Suddenly you could really embrace them and say, ooh, I feel their pain. And yet, Bulk and Skull are not guys that you should give a badge to. Yet don't want them to have any sort of authority. Tell him. Tell me. Talk. Tell him. Tell me. Guys, guys. Huh? Carry on, citizen. What's um, going on? Uh, sorry. That's top secret information. This weird painting of mold disappeared. We're trying to find out where it is. Way to go, Nimrod. Hey, listen, you guys didn't hear it from us, okay? Yeah, they did. Mm -hmm. When Doug fully got his, his teeth into us, you had Balkan Skull's private eyes. Okay, which was great and didn't quite serve the Power Ranger line at all. But it was the best bulk and skull stuff because it was shtick that had nothing to do with the plot. So it was the three of us, Polly, Greg, and I, on our own set working on our own things. So we came up with the most ridiculous, stupid stuff you'd ever want to meet. Who in their right mind would offer a job to you guys? You mean besides you? <laughs> Let me tell you something. You two walk out that door. Don't bother coming back. Some of the writers, and, and I say some, but the ones that I'm talking about know who they are. Like, they're great at taking the kernel and expanding it just enough and leaving the next thing for the next guy. And then they would riff off each off of each other, these three or four writers that we had over a long stretch. And they're, they're really excellent. Great weavers. And they gave us some great stuff. So over the course of years, like, what we ended up take, taking away from it is we thankfully got to change our characters from one note onto something that was a little bit more textured. And in fact, really at the end, we are, we are, we have the best characters on the show. It got to the point that uh, it was in later years, uh, three or four years into it, that if we were shooting Balkan Skull, if the uh, DP and I, if Alan and I happened to glance at each other, while these guys were doing their thing, we would burst into laughter and the take would be ruined. We loved working with them. Bulk and Skull are a force of nature. They are never static. Every reaction is an equal and opposite overreaction. Okay, here it is. Either you step aside or I blast you. <laughs> Jason and I, Although this, for years, was an issue, was a bone we would like want to pick that bone with someone. We were forced to share the same dressing room, and so that's always been interesting. But later, we were really thankful because we had the moments to work on our material together, and and you know, in the first four or five seasons, those bits were mapped out like, you know, the Russian ballet. And this is one of the reasons why Paulie and I worked out so well, even when I auditioned during my callback. Um, we got that script. We said, this is what we're gonna do. Here's the physical comedy. Um, I'm gonna slap you, you're gonna fall back, you're gonna get up, I'm gonna pick you up, I'm gonna move you. We would practice that over and over and over again. After rehearsal was done in front of the camera, Polly and I would go back and practice it again. We'd go someplace off on the side. We'd have mats. If we decided there was a fall, uh, we'd talk to the stunt team and get pads from them to say, we're gonna fall. If there was going to be any kind of liquid thing, any kind of food item, there was uh, probably five, six, seven, eight of them, just in case there was a mistake. Three or four extra costumes standing by so they can clean them quickly. Immediately the crew was like gravitating towards our performances because we were reasonably efficient. There, the, there wasn't a lot of dialogue, it was mostly physical stuff. We would come in, there was like a levity about it. And you know, we're both really kind of messed up looking humans and so they would be able to laugh at us to some extent and of course the costume department being under the gun perpetually to create the next bunny costume slash you know Italian waiter I mean you name it we've been in it they really lost it this time that's what you think. And sometimes 
they didn't have the time to finish those costumes because of having to costume a show with their team principals. And so we would be wearing stuff and it would, there would be like neat you know, pins and stuff. And, and there, were, there were moments, I can find moments I can see on camera. I remember when I was like stuck by stuff and I'm like, oh, that's where I, that's where I sit down on the pin, but I keep going. <laughs> see if you can find that. <laughs> so all that physical comedy was meticulously planned. And because Paul and I had backgrounds in physical theater, again, we had to know what it was. Every single look, kink, every single you know gesture, down to the beat. He and I developed a subtext that really, really efficient at building the gags. Like there was little weird names for these, for these moves. For instance, if we had a cross from point A to point B, and it had to be funny, like we had to be discombobulated. We would woogity over, woogity. I think Terry Winkless made up that term. We'd woogity over, ah, uh, ah. Uh. Okay, I'm gonna woogity out with the big arms, ah. Uh. And this is my favorite one, the giant banana. Yeah, th this is an art form. Well, you know, the giant banana comes from um, commonly being, um, asked to react to something that's off camera and it's always in a certain direction, right? So after four or five times of this in the first year, I was like, I need I need a visualization. And, and I need, you know, I really need something to give me, uh, you know, a focus. Like, what am I looking at over there? And the, di the director, and I, I believe that it might have been Koichi Sakamoto on second unit, I think, said to me that just imagine a giant piece of fruit up there. And I was like, you mean like a giant banana? And then I, of course, I'm running to Jason because this is like some novel thing. I'm like, Narvi, Narvi, you're not gonna believe this. I got this new idea. So it's a visualization tool. Up there, it's a giant banana. <laughs> So it's the moment of barely seeing it, forgetting it, and then looking at it again as it comes closer, trying to figure out what the heck it is, and then, it's a giant banana! And then it's, oh, I gotta get away from the giant banana! And then that's, that would be the giant banana. Those cues were really important because we didn't have a lot of time on camera. And <clears throat> as a physical comedian and, and, and a technical actor, I can tell you that the thing I hate the most is waiting on stage for some method guy to like have his moments when he feels it and has dug it out of the right suitcase that he keeps in his soul or like whatever. It's great when it works, right? So we would come on, we didn't have time. They, they, they would not allow us more than one or two takes and that was just because we were shooting on 16 or Super 16 with Elon and Jonathan and they had to go. So we had to be efficient. So that kind of begets the planning and then the dialogue. It's, it's interesting, we definitely could write a small dictionary of which only two copies would be sold. And of course, while we were doing the show, Paul Schreier and I tried to keep ourselves sharp. Um, we did theater on the side whenever we could. We did a couple productions of Hamlet. We asked Catherine, because she was like a number one actress on the number one kid show in the world, to play our, uh, our Ophelia in the production that I was Hamlet. So I had this weird kind of line cross where I had to love and, and, and sabotage her as, you know, as Ophelia you know, playing my fat Hamlet. Well, come on, fat Hamlet, total winner. There's a line in there and Claudius and Gertrude are talking and she says, well, Hamlet has forgotten all custom of exercises. <laughs> totally, I haven't, I haven't run in like months. The gym, not going there, Elsinore, it's a war, forget it. There was our side projects and there was the side projects for Fox and for Saban. The side projects that, that Fox and Saban did was sort of a lead up for a Bulk and Skull spinoff. And we had this big idea with with uh, <laughs> the Mexican Elvis, a guy named Elvez, and Bulk and Skull were gonna run some old hotel and all that stuff. And so they actually did these side projects to see how popular Bulk and Skull were with the little kids. And it was a, basically a clip show about Bulk and Skull because those were always my favorite characters because they were they were the antiheroes, they were the foils, and they were funny. And and I I just thought that Jason Narvi and Paul Schreier were extraordinarily funny actors with great character. So uh, we actually shot footage for that. It wasn't strictly a clip show. We used the cave set from VR Troopers. And the premise was that Bulk and Skull got stuck in a cave and they're in, you know, they're, they get over dramatic and they, they don't know if they're gonna get out so they go reminisce about, about their past and we did a lot of gags, psych gags with that. No, I was thinking that maybe we should try calling for help. 
Once again, you've proven me right. Skull, no one is gonna hear us from in here. Hey, wait a minute, I have an idea. Start digging. Unfortunately, the good, the bad, and the stupid was the end of the Bulk and Skull show. It didn't sell quite as well. I always had a problem with good, bad, and the stupid because the characters don't work as well when they're out of context with the rest of the episode. Now, there is something to be said for a staccato litany of anomalous nonsense, which is generally, oh, that was, those, are, those were what the days were like for us. But without the Power Ranger stuff in the middle, I don't know if the characters worked as good. So he and I were both like, eh, we like it, I don't know if we like it or not. In the end, we made it work, and, and I, but I still would rather watch a whole episode. Even with the stuff at the end, I watch, I watch it all when I watch them now. Move it! Jason, Narvi, and I really feel th thankful that we got the chance to do these characters, that we got to build it for you. Really what we did is we took these, these two little bullies and we gave a sort of voice to the outside world. For the people watching the show, we were like these mess ups that loved each other no matter what. And, and that is a message that is taken away by every viewer who wasn't in the crowd. No matter what that crowd was, and many of us, most of us, frankly, have been that person, right? We really tried to gear Bulk and Skull towards, in some ways, an older audience. So when people went back and watched it, or when parents watched it with their kids, they'd be like, you know, I may not get the, the, the spandex, the anime sort, but we dig, we absolutely dig on these, these two punks. It's cool to be the mess ups that, that are always behind each other forever. Because I mean, really, I love Jason. We're closer than brothers. Um, most of the big events in our lives, we've we've shared in one way or another. I'm getting all emotional. I, I fear recently he may have gone over the deep end and had a break with reality. But those years were good for him. I mean, what can I say? He's my brother. I mean, he's he's, he's uh, I'd say he's my alter ego, but um, you know, I don't want to uh, inflate his ego.